very great pleasure uh, to introduce Sophie Purdom. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a few things about her biography, but I'll start with, of course, the most important item, which is that she is a Brown alumna. That's right. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> she's done all kinds of really impressive things, for which she probably deserves a little bit of credit, but obviously most of the foundation of her future success rests sure. upon uh, yeah. uh, uh, that, that this Brown room. experience. I ate a lot uh, of free pizza in this room. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, uh, and she really is uh, a model of the sort of ever true Brownonian. Uh, she keeps giving back uh, to Brown University in a whole bunch of different uh, ways. So thank you so much uh, for, for today, but also for all of your efforts, including not only are we you know, taking full advantage of her generosity uh, today to speak and to podcast and all, all the rest, but also she's going to go teach tonight uh, uh, on a course that she helped create uh, a few years back on environmental finance. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, for, for being here. Let me just say a, a couple more things about her bio. She is um, the founder uh, and managing partner at Planeteer Capital, uh, which is a, a venture capital firm uh, for climate tech. Uh, and uh, before that, she worked um, at the Brown uh, Endowment uh, uh, and uh, started uh, an ESG fund within that uh, and also worked at, at Bain. Uh, sure. So um, she has lots of different experiences uh, that are relevant for our topic. Uh, and I'm going to turn over the floor uh, to Sophie for uh, about 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to the floor to all of you for, for Q&A. Uh, and uh, all questions are on the table. So uh, away we go. Away we go. Yeah. Thank you. And everything is fair, fair game here. Purposefully trying to keep this pretty open and collaborative. I can go deep into all sorts of different topics across the climate capital stack, as we like to call it. So if there are particular areas that are more or less interesting to you guys, if you're like, venture's boring, let's talk about debt, then we can absolutely do that. Though I probably think it'll usually be in the, the inverse of, of, of that. But um, um, let's see, I would it, should we launch like right on into frameworks and all of that good yeah. stuff or, or give a little ramp up of so how all of this came to be? Uh, you certainly could do that. Yeah, walk us through a little bit of your career path okay. and, then, and then go deep on the, the substance. Okay, great, great, great. Well, um, uh, to make sure that this isn't kind of like an N of one career path journey because all of y'all are on your, on your own exciting ones. Um, uh, it's true, it all started here at Brown. Was pretty lucky to get to be a guinea pig for what has now kind of become the very holistic uh, IBIS environmental studies and science curriculum. Um, which meant cobbling together everything from the original kind of studies curriculum and pulling in economics and lots of classes here at this institute um, all across campus and making my way over to the Brown Endowment, which frankly I didn't know even existed when I was on campus for the first couple of years, um, uh, let alone figuring out how that thing operated internally across all of the different asset classes and many billions of dollars, right, that are used to um, fund important things like like scholarships so that um, we can continue to operate around the, the institution. So I came into um, the endowment office with a big question around how can we improve the resiliency and also, frankly, economic upside from this climate stuff that we're so busy studying up on campus. So how do these two things kind of go hand in hand with the endowment as a uh, um, as essentially a case study, what can we do managing our own assets when we care so much about it, kind of you know up on the hill, um, studying it all day, and that's a big question. And back in the day, these three letters of ESG were not really even being talked about, right? And so that's environmental, um, social, thank you, governance. Um, I'd argue that if folks didn't know what that meant. Back then, now we've kind of swung almost all the way over to the other side, and there's a little bit of an overuse of that in a immaterial fashion, but, but we can get more into that thesis. So um, with the folks over there, I helped set up First of a Kind ESG Fund, which was a separate organization from the rest of the endowment where we then started to implement ESG practices, which look very different when you're talking about venture or private equity versus when you're talking about you know, real assets or, or straight up kind of like real estate due diligence. Um, um, helps set that up, helps spread that to a bunch of other 
similar endowments and, and organizations ended up writing a book on it and taught a course, which is still going on. I think it's our 12th semester teaching that course this time um, with Carrie Krosinski and then Ricardo Bayon also teaches a pretty similar class and really stoked that, that that's kind of started to take off on, on campus a bit here. Uh, made my way over to Bain. Um, there's a whole backstory behind that around uh, was running a family business to help fund um, putting myself through through Brown and that kind of fell apart right around when I was graduating but we can we can talk about that another time so went over to where they pay pay you a salary and um, and mostly focused on the private equity group seeing a ton of different industries knew what I was getting into there jumped out of that after a handful of years to go start a climate related business which our product is about as commodity as it gets it's a fertilizer product but instead of making ammonia fertilizer synthetically with Haber-Bosch process and some really huge kind of chemical fossil fuel derived processes, we use kind of the opposite of it, which is a microbe. So this bug that lives happily by itself in some rice patties and it happens to be really good at storing energy inside its body. We figured out how to make that bug super happy so it could store a ton of that energy as a bioplastic so it lives longer in the soil and therefore produces more of this ammonia and is a wholesale kind of replacement for synthetic fertilizers. It's cheaper, the plant's happier, there's no runoff, there's no you know, um, uh, uh, gasification when it hits the ground. Challenge is selling a new thing into farmers. Um, so that was my first chance. We needed, we needed capital to start that business, to hire people, to build bioreactors, to go out and, and meet growers in the field. And, and that was my first exposure to venture capital, um, which started as raising individual kind of 100K checks from folks in the Boston ecosystem to raising you know, about $70 million at this point in aggregate from all sorts of, of different ecosystem players. Um, I liked that <laughs> and wanted to do more of that and didn't really want to sell fertilizer for the rest of my life. So kind of meandered my way over to helping those investors find more of whatever we were building and we started calling that climate tech. Kind of a new term at the time. Folks have been calling us impact or you know, the remain the dregs of clean tech 1.0 or just sustainable ag tech. And it wasn't really any of those things. Um, simultaneously, I started writing again through a blog, which we called very factually climate tech venture capital, <laughs> CTVC. And uh, I think CTVC is up on the screen now. So, so it's become a, a pretty big publication. We've uh, got well over 60,000 subscribers and 75% kind of engagement rate, which is, I've heard, high for a newsletter. Um, and we track every dollar that flows through the venture ecosystem. That hadn't been done before. And it's important to know where all of the capital fits in all of these wide, wide, wide sectors, wide, wide, wide technologies of this emerging climate innovation landscape. So, you know, a dollar that goes into a hydrogen PEM cell is not the same as one that we would be getting at Kula Bio. Where does it come from? Who's giving it out? What are the kind of strings and requirements attached to that? Um, and from there, we started to map the whole ecosystem. And as those companies grow, they don't just need venture funding. They might need project finance or private equity or debt or, you know, certainly would love some, some grants from the Department of Energy. So we started to track those asset classes as well and built up this perspective of what we're now kind of calling the climate capital stack, for lack of a less nerdy term. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to share that kind of arc uh, since the last time I was in this room, I didn't know what a VC was uh, and I couldn't have told you what the heck any of the layers of the capital stack kind of meant. So hopefully that gives you one niche kind of winding path through going from being on campus, kind of picking up some skills, going and trying your hand, doing really risky stuff, pulling technology out of a lab to now trying to help scale that up so that other people can kind of come do the same. Um, and my next thing I'm building is called Planetier Capital, which is a venture capital fund. So I like to say we're kind of innovating and founding again, but this time we just happen to be building an investment management company. Um, and so from that, now I have to go out and raise money. It's not you know, surprise, it's not all my money, which was a lesson <laughs> that I learned pretty quickly. Um, and so we're out raising from big institutions that want access to those early innovators. So that's the structure and kind of how that venture model, if you will, works. I get paid when our companies do really well and I get to take a percentage of kind of the upside of that, if that makes sense. 
So, um, so Planetier is separate from CTVC behind me, and I'll put kind of on and off both of those hats over the course of talking this through, but I'm happy to jump into later on kind of any questions about what the heck does it mean to be a climate tech VC or, or what does that career path even look like? How do we diligence companies? All of those good things. Um, I'm just gonna keep monologuing so we get through some of this. So let me show you what I mean a little bit by the climate capital, capital stack. So this is open source, it's completely free. There's a bunch of resources over the past um, four years, I guess, at this point on this website. But um, just before New York Climate Week, which was, which was last week, we put out this update to what we're calling the climate capital stack. I'll scroll through all the kind of bullet points or whatnot and get to some of the good stuff to give you a sense of um, who, you know, there's a lot of these players out there. This is a smattering of who we see in the venture capital cohort. Um, these are hundreds and hundreds of firms which all specialize in different things. Some of them are specialists in ag or energy. Some are specialists by stage, right? So maybe they just do early stage stuff or they just do growth. And then some don't really specialize at all, but they're still big providers of capital to the ecosystem. So there might be some names in here like Union Square Ventures, USV, that, or, you know, uh, I don't know, KOTU that you've heard before. And these all have kind of dedicated professionals and are deploying a lot of money into, into climate alongside specialists like what we're trying to build at, at Planet here. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is maybe a helpful one to zoom in on really quickly. I spend a lot of my breath talking about this early stage of the ecosystem, this venture capital side, when you're sometimes the very first money in to a business. So a founder shows up with an idea, maybe it's at the pitch deck stage, they've put a couple you know, slides down to talk about vision, market, you know, uh, how does this fit into the competitive landscape? Who are they going to hire? What are they going to do with their use of proceeds, the money that they get to go build the thing? But there's nothing really there yet. Or it might be slightly later stage and you've got folks that are spinning out of a lab and there's something real hard and true and proven there with a bunch of data to kind of back it up and it's your job to figure out, do you agree? Is there a market for that? You know, are people going to pay for it? Um, or of course, at the later stage, you can start getting into actual dollars and cents style, like proper, proper diligence. Um, um, but this is, I bucket all of that onto the innovation side of the spectrum versus, you know, uh, there's certainly an argument to be made of climates here, which is, it's real, it's now, right? This, we can't wait 10 years for my little companies to kind of grow up and save the world. Like we've got to do something today. Ideally we did it yesterday. And so shouldn't we be talking more about deployment? about getting that steel in the ground. And that's where some of these other organizations that are doing more infrastructure style capital are playing. Um, this is just a small smattering of, uh, you know, trillions of dollars of deployed capital players. Um, not to mention the folks that sit in industry, right? All of these corporates that are deploying strategic capital straight off of their own, uh, uh, profit and loss statements off of their own balance sheets right into companies through to their, you know, explicit innovation arms as well, where they're looking for partnership and a financial return and maybe early opportunity to help pull that company in and acquire it in the future. Whole spectrum, all of this needs to kind of play together. We like to think about it as fluidly moving across this innovation to deployment spectrum. I shouldn't have a job, <laughs> you know, if we didn't still need innovation. If we had all of the solutions we needed today, we should just be pouring all of that capital straight into steel in the ground and, and deploying kind of the existing technologies that we've got. Of course, there's some balance between all of those. Most of the stuff that I'm backing will never make it through to deployment, and that's also, that's okay, right? That's the, that's the kind of model that we're going after. Um, so there's a whole lot more to be said like of, of this structure of the capital stack, who are the different players, but I wanna kind of get a sense of the room of whether 
you all are interested in this from a kind of structural perspective, where the pieces fit together, if maybe case studies might be of interest as well of companies and, and whether they're later stage or earlier stage that are actually doing the work would be interesting to chat through, whether it would be cool to talk about who are the personas of the people that are in these pretty privileged roles, how might that fit in with plans that you all have for your, for your own future, or we can take this and continue to make this a bit more academic and talk about underfunded, overfunded, hot sectors, returns, all of those pieces, but I want to, I know I've been going at it for a bit, so I want to um, This is great. recheck in with the room a bit first. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, at any time. Um, uh, raise your kind of kick us off. Oh, uh, Kim's already preempting me, so I'm happy to do that. Uh, Since we're here, we yeah. CTBC, yeah. just kind of stepping back and wanting to understand what is the business model for something like this that the in run, right? Like, happy to talk about that. You know, I know you have a lot of staff, and yeah. how do you support this amazing product right here? Thanks for asking that. So we were just talking about it, hence why we were a couple of minutes late. Yeah. We got really into the business model. So. CTVC at the end of the day is for the ecosystem. And we made a uh, uh, very explicit decision, myself and my co-founder, Kim, <laughs> to, um, to not monetize this product. This takes resources, but it's pretty, it's pretty efficiently run. This has actually been a side hustle for Kim and myself for four years at this point. Um, it's a pretty intensive one. And there's been uh, a roster of, I think, 60 different folks that have tapped in at various points in a volunteer capacity, lots of whom are brown students or young alums. Um, and the reason that they would do that is exposure and access and kind of thinking and, and, and uh, uh, opportunity to go get best in class jobs in the field by being affiliated with the brand. Um, the reason we didn't monetize this is it it's a, it's, a, it's a newsletter product through and through at the end of the day, and there's kind of capped upside to what that could look like. You either slap a, um, uh, a paywall on it, or you make people pay to subscribe to it, none of which we wanted to do. You slap ads on this thing, which uh, didn't feel meaningful, um, or you do pay-to-play content, which we didn't want to bias ourselves with either. What we hoped was that if we kind of kept going at it, and by tracking all of that data of the deals and the money flowing through the ecosystem that would have like a flywheel that would start turning at a certain point and it wasn't just writing blog posts. Mm -hmm. And we did find that and like pretty early. And then we've been building off of that for the past two-ish years, I'd say. Me building Planeteer, the fund, where I benefit from early access to looking at what companies are breaking out or founders coming to me because they want access to some of this data and information network effect of co-investors that feel supported from this or I'm smarter as a result of it, all of those kind of basic pieces, which will over time, Planeteer will stand alone with its own brand, but for now, certainly it's, you know, we uh, benefit from CTVC. And then this exciting, soon to be launched in like two weeks, uh, uh, new brand for this data subscription platform like a product called Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Bloomberg's big data provider, you have these fancy terminals, you type in and it gives you all sorts of information about different industries. Part of that focuses on clean tech. We're competing head to head with that, with our new product, which um, uh, we think is more climate native and from which we've poached a bunch of folks that used to run that product over to work on our thing. We raised venture funding from the John Doors and the Tom Steyers and the no close of the world for, for that. Um, we've got a a lot of very large, very excited customers. And that is a, that's a subscription software license product, which is already kind of doing really nicely and now helps fund some of the full-time writers for CTVC. One, one, way to, one way to go about it. Probably a bit of a longer term vision for it though. Uh, yeah. So if we can I take you in a different direction. Please, yeah. um, so last year we passed uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes. Uh, yay, yay, yay. Very, uh, you know, most important climate legislation uh, in at least a generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the US, wonderful, provided a, a big bang of, of money uh, for uh, different big parts of this. Big bang of promise of money. But yeah. so, 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 so this is the real question here yeah. is like, uh, despite all of that, um, in certain ways, I think uh, climate tech has maybe had had 
struggles, uh, continue to have struggles, especially in particular sectors. Uh, and so the wind sector in particular, we're seeing headlines about. Sure. And so I wonder if you could just sort of talk us through that space and, and um, to what extent is, is this, is you know, the world that you're in sort of all downstream of the IRA or is, this, uh, yeah. is, there, is there more going on? <laughs> uh, there is life beyond IRA, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. We've been celebrating this thing for a year plus now and it's like every day's a party and we like, you know, celebrate, celebrate IRA like it's like a newborn child or something very exciting and it is exciting, but it's certainly not all there, all there is. Yeah. Um, so these these sectors right that we talk about maybe i'll just nav you to a visual while we're while we're going at it um uh, sector they're going to continue to grow significantly um uh after and so um the bump from ira has really been where's a good visual okay like here's what i mean when i say like lots of stuff in climate right like some of these sectors some of these whatever you want to call them technology areas are more impacted than others by Inflation Reduction Act related benefits. Um, carbon, 45Q, right, like would directly impact here. We've got all sorts of electrification, like home benefits. We've got, you know, money flooding into different battery chemistries. We've got, you know, hydrogen certainly was a major benefactor. Um, and, and those subsectors saw more founders starting new companies there. And when they were at the, when they're at the kind of later stages in this Series B, Series C, some rounds greater than $100 million have been really, really difficult to raise over the past 18 months, kind of compared to the few years prior. Mm -hmm. The deals that did get through were ones that have some like direct potential benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act. Yep. That's more directional than anything. Um, at the end of the day, uh, just putting on my hat at the Venture Fund, for example, when I write someone a check, it's usually the first money in the door, and we're in partnership for at least 10 years. I have no idea if IRA is gonna be around in 10 years, right? It probably won't, it'll probably look completely different. Those like explicit subsidies, uh, I, I, I am not confident in, in um, I would seriously haircut those for anything that's more than like 18 months out. Um, what IRA has done in a, super beneficial way is give confidence to folks that were probably going to invest in those areas anyway, namely corporates and strategics that needed like a little bit of a nudge and a little bit of confidence and some kind of like political and local and, and um, national partnership to feel confident in um, undertaking those projects. Um, uh, but from the vantage point of being really early in the ecosystem, it's positive, but not something that I, develop my investment theses based off of, if that makes sense. Perfect, and I love this slide and I'm going to steal it shamelessly yeah, and it, probably, yeah. you know, students of uh, politics of climate change in future are gonna see some version of this. Uh, Amazing, uh, well, if you show this one, then you have to show its corresponding sister, which is, um, this, one's the, this one's the count of companies, right? Count of companies, so yep. Kula Bio would be, you know, one of them sitting in this green section, but then, uh, oh, I think we hit it this time because I've shown it so many times. This guy the is the money. So where do the dollars flow? And yes. you'll, I wish I had the slide to go back and forth and back and forth, but yes. you can see, right? A majority of the capital over, over half, uh, oh, 80% if you're including food and land use, flows into just these three large um, verticals. Uh, so you might hear a lot about carbon offsets and carbon removal. They are over here in this tiny little sub four billion dollar sliver. Whereas, you know, EV OEMs, batteries, whatever, a, just a couple large billion dollar rounds into like Commonwealth fusion systems skew the math. Um, and and uh, this, you know, the natural cousin of this chart would be the overfunded, underfunded kind of sector based off of its climate related impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can talk to Sophie into next week, but this is your chance. So please, uh, if you have questions, uh, would love to hear it. Catherine. Uh, one question on more of like a curve's eye view of climate finance. Um, what, what are the things that you're seeing that are kind of like driving the
what w what's the role of my little venture fund in all of that? As, as a, you know, just as a proxy for the industry as a whole. Yeah. Um, I, ever since being on campus here, I like staunchly believe, I, I don't believe in compromising returns. Um, and so I, there, there's separate kind of slices and tranches for catalytic capital that's got an impact mandate alongside a kind of financial returns mandate. Um, uh, the shop that we're running, we, we aren't concessionary in any way, shape or form with the intent of that in and of itself being impactful. Because when we have a 10x fund, right, if God willing, right, like that in and of itself will show that investing in climate is so massively profitable that the Mr. Burns and the whatever Cruella de Vils or something that are completely selfishly uh, motivated show up and want to back climate and help drive more money into the field. That's, that's kind of like pie in the sky level of it. I'm not sure if I was answering what you were going after there, but from a like motivation, um, I'll be the, you know, I'll be the first to say that though I care personally from an impact perspective and live my life and uh, um, write about right these things from my fund, I'm managing the money of uh, folks that don't get to make that choice always. And um, you know, if, if I'm backed by an endowment, they need those returns to go live their impact mission out, um, e.g. scholarships. And so my job is just to make a bunch of money, which happens to be aligned with impact because I know that these sectors are some of the fastest growing like on the planet. Great question. Well, first of all, this is from private companies, not from public companies. So we cut off all of this like fancy graph building at that growth capital stage. So um, uh, I definitely didn't know these funds when I was in school, but like when it reaches like the TPGs or the Harbor Vests or the, the big kind of like funds, that's no longer like early stage venture. So we cut it off. Um, completely agree and love the way that you're thinking about Data doesn't always, data can tell whatever story you want it to. Um, and, um, and there's all sorts of data points that are immaterial. And ESG is like one of the worst <laughs> performing in, in that camp. I, I felt that ages ago, right? And that was like the big tension of still believe that by performing, outperforming on certain ESG criteria, you can drive superior financial returns. But the trick is that sometimes it's not collecting the right data, or, or even if the data is accurate, it's on the immaterial kind of drivers. And so, you know, classic case study of who cares about the re paper recycling office rates of Aramco or something when Aramco's core product is pumping oil and gas out of the ground. Um, but it might skew the readings. So, so um, the, uh, what's the right word? I'm, I'm bored with ESG and I have been for a long time and I moved my entire career away from that space pretty early. Um, and hence going and having a allergic reaction to that and going and starting a company, which felt like the kind of counter force to it. Um, it you know, uh, rather than monitoring the performance of fertilizer and oil and gas companies, I was like, why don't we just start a better one? <laughs> I'm oversimplifying, but, um, and, and we talk a lot about this in like classes, right, of how can I live my life with the most impact or how can I have a career with the most impact? And at the end of the day, like it really truly just is a personal thing of how close do you need to be to touching and feeling the change um, uh, versus how much are you okay with kind of more of the enabling, influencing, structural kind of like forces around it. I wanted to feel both, um, so went and kind of got as close to the changes I wanted to, like creating a net new product and a net new company. But then I realized that I didn't want to be just one point on the board. And my brain fits better like this stuff where I just love having all the data kind of flowing through and getting to find the patterns in it. Um, uh, which is to say, get to do like an enabling, really privileged spot, like getting to like talk to the market all the time. 
but now I'm ready to go build again and to, and to place bets on some of those points on the board. So if you can I just pick up on this idea of like the, the incumbent companies, yeah. uh, which are really important, but so important. maybe not so important, maybe not so much fun to try to police and monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, how can your early stage companies, oh, yeah. like, how do they interact with oh, incumbents yeah. and either um, inspire or oh, yeah. you know, strike fear in the incumbents to motivate them to change their behavior? Totally. We, I didn't mean to toss incumbents under the table. They have arguably a much more important role than any of the folks that, that like we're working with. Um, and we spend a lot of time with them trying to partner. So it was just New York Climate Week, which uh, I don't know if any of you guys have been, but it's a party in New York City. And um, I was saying like le the first couple times I went while in college, it was with like a paper mache earth on a stick and like, you know, rallying like outside of the UN and like, <laughs> And now the reason I brought that up is because we're now we're convening the heads of sustainability at Dow Chemical and like all of these other big corporates um, uh, in rooms like this where it's like startups on one side and the corporates on the other. And my job is to facilitate the like get past the greenwashing, get past the big 2050 whatever commitments and get to like literally what needs to be true. Like what do you need so that you can switch your machine to run from a different feedstock, right? Or um, insert the other and, and facilitate the conversation between both of them. Mm -hmm. That is, that's like, that's the very collaborative kind of aspect of it, of uh, uh, my companies make money by selling net new stuff into whether that's straight up infrastructure or feedstocks or whatever, um, operational efficiencies into the incumbents. Yep. Um, that very, very, very important from a revenue kind of like perspective. The flip side would be, we say at Planetier that we invest in transition, which would be that kind of like partnership, and disruption, which would be the more aggressive part of those conversations of, well, if you can't service it, you know, we're doing it cheaper, better, faster than you are, um, and we're eating your lunch. And so one nuance about climate um, markets that's in some other slides, which we can share on later if of interest, is um, uh, there's this narrative that climate companies have worse financial outcomes. Um, Cleantech 1.0 was that. <laughs> uh, Cleantech 1.0 is not climate tech, right? There's like fundamental differences. And Cleantech 1.0 being um, a bunch of venture capital specific, you know, enterprise SaaS dollars that flowed into commodity, usually energy, like clean energy products. And uh, went head to head from a commodity pricing perspective. And I'm like way oversimplifying here. You're probably having like an allergic reaction, but when got you say out what, what time period are you thinking? Uh, uh, 20, 2006 to 20, uh, I don't know, 2010s kind of like time period, um, right. kind of being the boom and bust of it. And then <sighs> there being a fallow zombie, whatever word you want to call it period up until 2020. Um, you know, Kula Bio kind of was in the end of that, so I no one really knew what to call us. And there have been some success stories in that time period since. And also, if you happen to hold a bunch of the Cleantech 1.0 supposed failure stocks, you'd be sitting very pretty right now with a like four to five X. So failure is an exaggerated term. It means that you bought very high and you sold low, so you're just probably a bad investor. But in any case, um, <laughs> where is I even going with this? Um, <laughs> Honestly, I completely lost my thread. I got on the clean tech 1.0. Oh, it's different this time. The different thread. from the, the climate tech, the, the world that you're oh, in. Oh, that's now. correct. Right. So there's like the transition and then the disruption. And as we're building a portfolio um, ourselves, we like to balance that out. And we skew probably more on the transition rather than the straight up disruption side. Okay. Many of my peers uh, uh, will choose to invest like all in on moonshots, right? So completely new ways of uh, doing business, which um, uh, there's less room for partnership, but there's more room for acqu being acquired, yeah. maybe sometimes earlier right. because you're a threat, right? To, or, or you're an additional revenue opportunity, whatever you want to call it, to the incumbents. And so we see in climate tech versus maybe some other sectors, even bio or certainly, you know, enterprise SaaS stuff, that there's higher outcomes earlier for climate related businesses because financial services firms, energy transitioning companies, snap them up. 
because um, these are new revenue lines and are also threats to their underlying thing. And so it's just easier to go buy that company soon before it becomes too big of a threat to them. Please. Yeah. Your, your work is primarily linked with the climate change. But there's another feature for elements of uh, green technology of the world possible. For instance, and, uh, the steam engine kicks in industrialization. And this which is messy, it's dirty, I believe. And uh, then, you know, the truly ancient can uh, uh, take, take over, right? But still polluting. And, uh, so, so the, the, the electrical battery engine, on the other hand, it, you know, it's elegant, it's, it's manageable, it's compact, mm -hmm. it could be charged by natural resources, sun, wind. So to me, it, it just, uh, the green technology is almost a necessary consequence of human technology evolution. Hmm. And uh, so my question is, does the public embrace hmm. or adopt, appreciate the green energy primarily because of intrinsic virtue hmm. rather than passion? Mm. Now, as you know, our tourism is rare, but a patient of good things alive to come, right? Could that be your, your business pitch? I certainly hope so. I think there's probably 500 million people on the planet that make decisions based off of virtues or because they care about climate change intrinsically, and then the many, many, many billions of others don't have that privilege. So. These companies will succeed when they're better products and they're cheaper and they're faster and the cars are, you said it nicely, you know, just uh, uh, better, better to drive, more elegant in design. Um, I, I mean, absolutely, right? The idea is these are superior technologies, replacing, transitioning, disrupting, uh, uh, harder to work with, more polluting ones. Yeah, so I think you should get this kind of message across. Like Come join me, please. You're going to tell them the story. Yeah, thank you. So we look at this like the money versus money growth kind of from the top down to look at the whole picture of the industry. But I'm wondering from the bottom up, from like startups mm. standpoint, like as posting, I feel like as a practitioner, I feel a bit blinded because I only know I can do like a little calculation on my current stage, my current product, but like my inventory from the vendors, I don't know. I also talk mm. to like the different bigger companies, also. they can do the scope one calculation, but they don't know scope two, scope three. So do you have any suggestions, or like, is there any future framework for the startup to actually not be blinded on this, their ideas, of like, hmm. assess their future kind of impact, so hmm. make this whole industry thriving and grow faster? Hmm. I love that. Are you a builder? Are you starting a company? Yeah, so cool. right now I'm building a machine that can yeah. And I want to that machine as a platform to enable more material scientists, designers to create their own material to mass produce and so cool. start use. However, for me, actually, I feel grounded because hmm. when we talk about the elements, it's like a cradle to grid, cradle to gate, cradle to cradle. They all can generate so different results. And the material we're talking about, like non-natural binder, but eventually they cannot be recycled. And people say, oh, you can upcycle them, mm. reuse it. But I have concern, will that really happen? How efficient will it happen? So right. I feel like, I mean, limited to have the overall scope of the whole industry, even I have aspiration to create some cool thing. That's and great. Make impact. Yeah. That's great. We should chat after for sure. Um, and I agree, this stuff's like pie in the sky, high level. You're probably like in one little slice of that and wondering about the baselining and the metrics that matter and, and what language is being talked about in assessing that type of business model. Um, you're right, that wouldn't make sense to compare it to whatever, EV, OEM, batteries. Um, so I'm happy to chat after about what some of those metrics might look like and, and point you in the direction of some resources of folks that are really good at helping do some of that like baselining analysis. Yeah. I think I saw another hand. Okay. I was just going to ask about kind of how, um, given there's so much variability in the end of the reporting of these companies, um, 
um, mm -hmm. how you standardize yeah. their um, results to rate them and understand which investment is better. Great. So for, so, so for CTVC, we keep it simple. We're just tracking the amount of money that they raised from whom and therefore at what stage. And we make an assessment of all of these buckets of, you know, you're just looking at kind of the sector one. We rank them on about 20 different dimensions um, and make sure that that evolves over time as their business models as well kind of evolve. Um, we do that through a bunch of, most of it's public information, but lots of it's shared now kind of privately or at least first with us because uh, folks want to get the word out through our, through our channel. But that's for CTBC. Maybe you're wondering also about how we do diligence on materiality or impact or any of that at, at Planeteer, is that right? Cool, um, there's no secret sauce. <laughs> so, and also these, like this is a bunch of complex sectors, right? Like if, if uh, I don't, but say I had a PhD in carbon removal, that's probably not gonna help me assess the next, you know, whatever, uh, uh, seaweed material alternative. Um, how do we go about doing that? We are able to tap into a whole bunch of folks who are true experts and know exactly what questions to ask them in our diligence process, uh, and then how to kind of sense check that to sniff out whether this is real or true if the product actually does the thing or not. So that's a massive oversimplification of the kind of the technical assessment, which I'll be the first to say like heavily relies on external experts. We're a fund of two people. There's no way we could host all of that internally ourselves right now. Um, we do a massive amount of market analysis. So that's competitive landscape. And that's, you know, do companies even exist in this space yet or not? Are they offering the same products and services? Pricing, how well funded are they? Um, do they have specific kind of like channels to market? And then spend a ton of time on go to market, which is, um, uh, I learned as a builder, building a fertilizer business, we had a, like, it felt like magic what we could do. We could, like, we could, for 10x cheaper, make the same commodity product in a way that was delivered better. Challenges, all in how do you literally get the product in a new form factor out onto something as spread out literally as fields. And so for that, we, it didn't make sense to build up our own sales channel. We needed to do some serious partnerships with legacy players. And so uh, right there, all of a sudden, you're talking about pretty low margin business for, um, uh, Anyway, we can go into this more, but but like the distribution is like a heavy, heavy, heavy emphasis for us because these value chains are all different, and the value doesn't accrue uh, symmetrically across them. Um, there's often kind of points where innovators can really go go tap into that and also defend it um, as these markets move around a lot. So, um, and then the piece that I didn't mention is just like this game is all about people. Um, there's usually there's usually nothing there. But the thing that's hopefully not going to move is the person on the other side of the table. And everything's going to pivot. Everything's going to change. Inflation Reduction Act might go away. The incumbent might explode or totally come by. Like, everything's going to change. It's, it's all about, do you want to be in partnership with that person for a really long period of time? Do they have the basic understanding, the, like, deep insight? Are they going to have the grit? Are they going to be there for forever? Are they dedicating way more than they're, like, uh, this isn't just a job? I could go on and on about that. I feel like, honestly, much of my... Uh, diligence work is like falls more on the psychologist kind of side of the table than, than the PhD side. Yeah, please. Um, so I was wondering how you find investors for the planetary funds yeah. when you're just starting out like are they wealthy individuals or companies and yeah. also these investors like different from whoever would invest in like traditional Great question. Um, I am obsessed with this because I spend most of my day fundraising myself right now. So uh, all sorts of different LP types um, at a high level. They are usually not individuals. Sometimes they're ultra high net worth individuals. So uh, we can talk about this publicly, but um, uh, a big a big investment into Planeteer came from a limited partner. I'll call that an LP now. I'm a GP. I'm a general partner. So, so the person that runs it, GP, the person that gives the GP, the money is the LP. One of our major LPs was the CTO of Facebook or Meta for a really long time. He's a very, very close friend of mine at this point. And, um, and he was one of the first folks that stood up and said, I want to write you a check. Um, so that's kind of rare. Sometimes those folks organize and have staff uh, that help them manage their money into a family office structure. Sometimes those pool together. 
Then you might have investment advisors that work with a bunch of family offices or other types of organizations. Um, sometimes those are called outsourced chief investment officers. And then you might have, you might be interfacing with chief investment officers at foundations or at endowments where they have a kind of nest egg um, made up of all of these different manager relationships, but they've got to siphon off a certain amount of money to go towards their philanthropic or their operating causes like year over year. Um, you, you know, we have folks that are just straight up other funds that want access to us because uh, we help them with deal flow and we're a great strategic partner and they want to like piece of, piece of the pie. Um, uh, what else am I missing here? We, corporates, strategic corporates will often invest in venture funds as well. Um, so that's everyone from kind of like transitioning energy companies depending on how much you want to get into that kind of mess through to more of the pure kind of like clean tech players. Um, we have, uh, there's fund of funds that are a large tranche of the market as well. So these are funds that if I'm the GP and they're my LP, they've got LPs too. So there's layers of fees. And the reason that would work is because uh, their LPs believe that they're the best at diligencing people like me just like I think I'm the best at diligencing like founders. All sorts of different pools. I didn't know like any of these existed until basically two years ago. And they are certainly not all created equal. They want different things. They write different check sizes. They have different diligence processes. They have different timelines. Some are much more institutional than others. Some go off of their gut like I raised well, I, uh, whatever, I won't say, I raise a large, uh, some serious like chunks of money during climate week from folks that just kind of wanted to come see me um, versus these 18 month long intensive diligence processes from like big institutions, for example. So it's a, it's a skill set. I mean, I feel like I play like therapist and or, or whatever, psychologist, and then I play sales function. And then when I'm lucky, I get to go do the actual work and do diligence, yeah. If I had a spare billion dollars rolling around my back pocket, I would definitely be investing. Oh, in thanks. Let's make sure that got in the recording. Yeah, do we? <laughs> I can assure you that uh, Brown professors are not paid that way. Uh, <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, um, I think you made clear kind of your stance on ESG reporting, but uh, I still have a question about that. Yeah. So, from my understanding of the U.S. versus like more even UK market, I think there are a lot of driving forces like you text on that are actively impacting like how the climate space works in Europe. Yep. And I've noticed that a lot. So do you think that there's kind of a gap or divide between the two markets? And like, mm -hmm. is it, it's quite hard for like EU players to come and enter the US market and vice versa, do you see that? Yeah, that's nuanced. Thanks for bringing that up. You're correct that there's geographical differences. And I was being, um, I was painting with a big brush when I kind of tossed all of ESG under the bus, which is not how I actually feel. Um, yeah, I mean, even for venture managers to go access some of that EU capital, I'd need to comply under things like Article 9 and do a whole bunch of different types of reporting, which are uh, resource intensive for a small organization. And again, I like really immaterial. Um, agree with the ethos of where all of that stuff is coming from, but how on earth do I conduct an impact assessment on my company that I invested in last week, which is like, a guy that's about to go get lab space to build a battery. Like, I don't know, Do, are we, there should be no impact now because there's nothing there, but if he succeeds in 10 years, then it should have a huge, you know, positive, uh, well, I guess negative uh, uh, carbon-like impact. Um, we can talk about that stuff like all day, but um, uh, I get excited by um, some of these task forces that are coming together. They're often the like task forces on top of the task forces. Um, to really drive to, again, at the end of the day, it's just like the materiality for that specific asset class. It's just, there's so many nuances um, around like time frames and scope and literally the scopes, right, of those different climate impacts that it's hard to do one kind of broad assessment. Great. I think we have time for maybe one last question. And then I think we should wrap. Yeah, please. Do you have an avenue through which people who might not necessarily You but bet. We want people to leave or 
where we, people need a feeling of power, and, and a lot of them aren't necessarily going to go into sustainable investing. But yeah. we are looking for an avenue through which they can, you know, take an action. We're giving mm. them a lot of, of, of educational advice and empowering mm. them. But then, I think people leave, and it's kind of a now what situation. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, smaller actions that people can take in that situation? Yeah, there's all sorts of personal finance type of stuff that I'm happy to talk about. <coughs> Again, I don't think that's, uh, I don't even action that myself, so I, uh, it's kind of really, if you just want to feel like engaged on that front, to be super candid. Um, angel investing is interesting when and if that ever becomes accessible, even for like a couple hundred bucks, you can kind of participate in that these days. Um, but in reality, I kind of take it up a couple notches and say, uh, let's keep picking on these battery guys, right? Like. They, they might feel like they're working on climate because they're coming out of a lab with their battery technology and they're gonna go build this in the world. Like that's pretty easy to slot on this slide and say they're working on climate. But in reality, I think lots of jobs are or will be or should be climate jobs. Um, we were talking about a close friend who's a climate journalist, right? Like he didn't, necessarily start like fully in that path and it's kind of woven his way over that direction. You can you can work on climate by writing. You can work on climate by being an electrician, right? Like on, like on and on and on. It's all of these different skill sets. Um, and there are all sorts of organizations, which uh, I love the conference that you guys put on. I got to help with that in early days. Um, happy to bring in some of those specific orgs like one called Work on Climate. We all like really literal names, apparently. And uh, 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 organizations called Climate Base and others that have a lot of resources around um, how do you either literally go find a job in climate or how do you think about shaping whatever career you're in to have kind of a climate bent towards it. Well, Sophie, you are uh, so charismatic and so competent that it is not surprising to me that you are good at raising money. So uh, thank you so much. Charismatic and competent. Uh, <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking.